Good morning, family. Will you stand and worship with us this morning?
Psalm 84, one through four says, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. How beautiful are those words that we um, can just find peace and respite in his presence. Um, I know in my life, and I'm sure probably in many of your lives, um, it's so easy to get caught up in everything that's going on. There's um, work, there's family, there's this, there's that, and everything is trying to grab my attention. And I start to feel overwhelmed. Um, but I realize when I start to feel overwhelmed that I've forgotten my first love, and I've forgotten the place that I can find peace and joy and hope, and that's in him, right? So I would encourage you today and uh, going into this week, don't, don't forget who your first love is because when I'm focusing on him first and everything else comes afterwards, I can find that joy and I can find that peace and I don't have to feel overwhelmed because I know that I have a God who's fighting for me um, and that, you know, I don't have to be anybody else other than who I am because he loves me just as I am, right? It doesn't mean I don't have to start trying to be better, right? And kind of um, go towards what he's called me to, but um, I don't have to hold up a image for the other people around me. I feel like I do that all the time. Um, but I can just be his daughter, right? Um, I think that's so beautiful. So let's join together and just pray this morning. Lord God, we thank you that you are good, Lord God. We thank you that you are holy. And we thank you that in your presence, Lord, I don't have to hold up any faces, Lord God. I don't have to hold up any masks um, because I can just be who you've made me to be, Lord God. We thank you that in you we can find joy and peace um, and shelter, Lord God. Um, and that you're our Father, Lord. You love us and you call us to yourself even when we mess up, Lord God. You walk alongside us and you help us to fix the mistakes we've made and to keep moving forward to become more like you. Lord, I pray today that we would forget about the things that are outside of this building, Lord. Um, everything that's grabbing our attention, Lord. And that we would be reminded of our first love. Help us to never forget that. We love you and we thank you in your name.
Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of dark, of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we live in a dark world full of struggles, illnesses, depression, and confusion. I ask that you help us put on your full armor, Jesus, so that we can stand firm in your truth. Strengthen our faith, Lord, and fill us with the knowledge and wisdom of your word. Help us to be alert and praying at all times for your guidance. May we find peace, Jesus, knowing that you and only you are in control of everything. We love you and we need you. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. Welcome, everyone. My name is Norma, and I want to send a, a, a special welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us. And before you take your seats, please turn around and greet someone. There you are. <laughs> I can't see. <laughs> all righty. All righty. Thank you. A special, special welcome goes out to those of you who are here for the first time. If you're here for the first time, we would ask that you complete a welcome card. It's a great way to get connected to us and stay connected and find out what's going on in the church. And it's a great way for us to reach out to you. Um, so please go ahead and fill that out. And once you're done, you can hand it to the ushers in the back with the lanyards on. And we'd like to give you a special welcome gift for doing that. Now, um, you can also, for those of you online, you can certainly fill out a welcome card as well. Now, and in regards to announcements, um, the Christmas offering, thank you. We as a church have um, gathered $2,123.64 for our, our um, special Christmas offering, so thank you so much for that. But as a church, we will give a total of $5,000 to help Jose and Joanne Carrillo start the orphanage in Mexico. So thank you so much for your generosity. And um, also some great news, our life groups have kicked off. So yay for life groups. And if you haven't already signed up for one, please, please, we encourage you to do so. It is a great way to study the word, fellowship, and meet, be amongst believers. You know, iron sharpens iron, right? Um, it's a great way to, so please, please consider joining if you have not already. And today, one youth, um, just a reminder for all you, uh, seventh through 12th graders, you will meet um, after church today in the basement until 315. So thank you so much. And in regards to offerings, please use this offering uh, envelope if you're going to tithe today. <laughs> um, also, you may write a check and address it to New Life Community Church. And in the memo, you can write Norwich. And also, the best and easiest way is to give online. So it's easy to sign up for that, and you don't have to worry about filling out this stuff, right, when you come to church. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for your generous church, Jesus. 
help us continue to be cheerful givers, Father. And may all our offerings benefit not only our church, but our community. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Hey, New Life family. Pastor J.C. Rojas here. We're excited to tell you about our newest location to New Life Community Church here at Eastside Chicago. We're asking for a couple of things from you. Please continue to pray for us as we come alongside this community and the people that have been here for a very long time in this church. We're also asking that you invite family and friends that you know of that live here around the East Side community. The invitation is also for you if you're able to join us on our grand opening day, April 2nd at 10 a.m. We hope to see you there. God bless. It's exciting. This church is growing. The Church of Jesus Christ. I love that song. Man, even though the shadows kind of darken and deepen, uh, and, and what I see is, is darkness starting to spread throughout the world, I am confident that nothing could stop the, 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 the gospel. Nothing. Nothing could stop the gospel. It will continue on. Nobody can silence Jesus Christ. You can't resist Jesus Christ. You can't run away from Jesus Christ. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord, and he's going to make it happen, and he proves it's true over and over and over and over so uh, let's open up our Bibles to the book of Colossians, chapter 3. i got to kind of preach early, uh, quickly today, <laughs> because uh, we're going to have how many baptisms? Three baptisms today? Or two? Two baptisms. <laughs> Next time we'll have three baptisms. Uh, but we want to we wanna make enough time for that. We want to hear the good testimonies of how God worked in, in these people's lives to kind of bring them to this place of surrender. So we're going to be looking at Colossians chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through uh, 4, and then we're going to move down to verses 12 through the, uh, through the end of chapter 17. But before we do, I want to read for you, as you close your eyes, um, these lyrics from a wonderful old, uh, wonderful old hymn. It says, When I survey the wondrous cross upon which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gains, I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. <laughs> Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, saved in the death of Christ my Lord, all vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his hands, his head, his feet, sorrow and love flowed mingled down. Never did such love and sorrow meet or thorns compose so rich a crown. If the whole realm of nature mine, that would be an offering far too small. Love so amazing, love so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Uh, when I was at uh, Montclair this morning, I was just kind of sitting by myself, and I was looking at the cross. There's a cross over the baptismal, and there's a light behind it, and I just was looking at it as I was praying for the service, and uh, I closed my eyes and I could see the imprint of the cross in my brain. It was almost like it burned itself into my retinas. And that's what happens when you are born again. Literally, the cross of Jesus Christ burns itself into our retinas. That's all you can see. You might be tempted to look at sparkly things, things that really, really are attractive to us because I'm still saddled with this flesh. There's tons of stuff that are going to still appeal very much to me. But at the end of the day, even if I go in a temporary direction, grab something that's out of God's will and hold it for a period of time, that cross is burned into my retina. And I know that eventually I have to leave it and I have to go where I belong. Amen. That's what it is to be born again, folks. That's what it is to be born again. So let's pray. Oh, did, did we pray already? No, we didn't. All right. I also want to say this. Um, we, we also, whenever we take an offering... 5%, no, I'm sorry, 10% of our offering goes towards missions. That means we are involved in planting other churches. So whatever we bring, we put in a general fund. So if God provides for us to open up 10 churches within a six-month period, that's your offerings. That's your offerings that are being used on the east side of Chicago or in Indiana or even in the various parts or neighborhoods of the city of Chicago. So I want you to remember that when you're giving. Remember you are giving toward God's grand purpose, and uh, it's, it's great to be involved in it. So let's pray. Father God, I just want to say thank you for everything that you give us, Lord God. Lord, I want to thank you for the richness of Jesus and who you are, Lord God. I want to thank you for the beauty of hymns, Lord God, that makes my soul 
uh, literally break down when I, when I sing these songs and I, I remember, Lord God, it doesn't matter if I'm tired. It's like you bring me back to that place to where I just heard the message for the very first time. Lord God, I was, I was absolutely broken, Lord God. I had no desire for you at all. I didn't want you. I would have never wanted you, Lord God. You chased me down, Lord God, and you made me your own. And Lord God, you'll never give up on me. You'll never give up on me, Lord God. You will always have your way in my life. And Lord God, I want you to be praised and I want you to be honored and I want you to be glorified, Lord God. And I don't want just me to get where you want me to be. I want us all to get there. So I'm asking, Lord God, with, with a fullness of desire and heart that you would transform us like in your presence, Lord God. And we pray this with one heart and one voice in Jesus' name, amen? amen. All right. Sorry for being such a crybaby. Um, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 says this. Since then, Paul speaking, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Why is he saying that? Simply put, there are things that sparkle around us. There are things that are very attractive to the flesh that we are settled with that will grab our attention. And it will promise us that it has what we need. This is what you really need. If you've been living in the world, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Man, I need this. I need that. I need this job. I need that package. I need this insurance. I need that relationship. I need that car. I need this. I need that. And Jesus is like, yeah, those things are okay sometimes, but what you really need is you need unity with me, and there's only way for that to happen. That's for you to believe in me, surrender to me, and trust in me. That's it. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to get to the Father but through me. <laughs> He says, set your heart on things above where Christ is seated and at the right hand of God. At right hand of God, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. You have to remember that this is a constant struggle. It is a constant struggle. We will fight to various degrees this this desire within us to kind of pull away. That's what Paul says. He goes, why do I do the things that I do not want to do? Even when I want to do the right things, the good things, I feel this thing that's like a tug of war within my flesh and it makes me fight back and forth. And I feel this war within me and he goes, man, I'm a wretched man. How am I ever going to be saved? And he says, then I remember, God the Father has saved me through Jesus Christ. It is his work that has saved us. It is not our work. It is not a partnership of the two. And anyone who says it is, is not aware of the gospel. I will defend the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel because no matter what the world says or the Pharisees say amongst us, the gospel is the power of God to transform us. That's where God has invested his power. Okay, let's go down to verse 12. Therefore, he's saying, because of all these things, therefore, God has, as God's chosen people, remember, you are God's chosen people. You are holy and you are dearly loved. That means we are to try to live as holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Ooh, that hurts. You know, we have a tendency sometimes to go, wait a minute, do you know what that person did to me? Man, I, I, I'll, I'll follow you up until this point, but are you asking me to forgive this person, to let that person off the hook? Do you know what they did? He, he does. He does know. And he says, I want you to forgive whatever grievances you have over uh, with someone else. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Has the Lord forgiven you? Has it affected your heart? Has it affected your mind? It has mine. It's so powerful in my life, even though I am flawed and imperfect as I really am. It has burned itself into my retina. It is always the great corrector in my life. And that's what he's saying. Forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. That means sometimes we must build relationships with one another where we can say things to one another that may not be pleasing, that may touch things that we don't want it to touch. But you know what the gospel also does? It doesn't, it, it doesn't allow me to feel like I'm at a, 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 a point of superiority where I can look down on you. He says, be careful that you don't do that. He goes, because you, you, in this 
place where you think you are, you can easily slip from this. Forget where you came from. That's what Christ is saying to us in layman's terms. He's like, don't ever forget where you came from. Don't ever forget how you got here. It wasn't you who did it. It was me who did it. So when you're admonishing one another, let, let the love of Christ richly dwell in you. And then he goes this. And as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your heart, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That is a joyful heart. And as I said last week, that produces something in my life. It produces a joyful perseverance. And, and I'm going to tell you this right now. It's not starting that gets you there. It's not starting. Anybody can start. Anybody can receive. Anybody can enter into the waters of baptism. I don't know. You want to get baptized? You want to go through the blue book? You profess you believe in Jesus Christ? I have baptized many people that I do not see in the church today. It's perseverance to the end. If the word of God dwells in you, if the spirit of God is in you, you will persevere. You will bear fruit. It's just the way it is. All right, let's, let's remember we're talking about the marks of sonship, and it's going to be a very quick sermon, hopefully. Um, we were reminded of God's great gift to us. And what is the great gift of Jesus? It is the gift of adoption. We, through Jesus' devoted love to his Father and his sacrificial love to us, God has chosen us, and we are God's chosen and beloved. This whole week, because we were, weren't we, didn't we meet this Wednesday, or am I missing the weeks? Didn't we have prayer and week worship this week? Monday. Yeah, Monday. It was Monday. Man, this whole week, I kept praying that, it, who is worthy to open up the throne? Do you understand what's happening in that scripture? J uh, John is looking at the, the state of the world. He's looking at the, the the problem that simply cannot be fixed. And all he can see is there's no solution. He's like, there's no solution. And he sees the law. He sees the seal of God's, uh, of God's uh, mercy. Whoa. All right, Lord. Um, and he's starting to cry. If you can remember, he's crying. And one of the elders comes up to him and he's like, why are you crying? And he's like, can't you see the problem? Can't you see the problem? Nobody can fix this. And he goes, don't you know the Lamb of God has the power to break this seal open? And then he sees it, and everything is open to him. Jesus is the answer for all the problems that, that, that plague our society, the cursed, ridden world that we live in. Man, it's a powerful thing. And all this week, I could say, who is worthy, Lord? You are worthy. You are worthy of all glory and honor and praises. Every sacrifice you make, he is worthy of it. And we are tempted in our flesh to measure that response out. Well, isn't it too much? Haven't I given too much? Well, God, surely you don't want me to have miss out on this thing. And he's like, if I want it, it's not for you. I have better for you. That's what he's saying. And not only that, at the end he's saying, when you, are, when you bring this sacrifice to me in the end, you will see how worthy I was of this sacrifice that you gave me. Man, we're talking eternal purpose in that, man. So remember, we as his children have been brought here. We are not accidents. We are not, uh, we are not a chance appointment. We are not a mistake. We didn't even get here, as I understand the scripture, by self-decision. We were here because God predetermined choice of who he was going to save. That means you are here for a purpose. You are called by God personally. And I want you to remember that. And if this is true of you, then you must remember that you now see God as a loving and a perfect father. I don't care who your father was on earth. I don't care whatever examples you may have seen. This is someone who can be completely trusted. He is skilled. He is powerful. He is able. He is willing to take care of us. And I, I, I was reading something from a, 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 a Protestant divine, they call him. These were scholars, great men. John, uh, Jonathan Edwards, and he was saying, all of my disobedience stems from one root, lack of faith. And I was like, no, 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 that's not true. That's not true. When I read it, I was like, that's not true. And it is, it is true. God's saying, don't. And I'm like, but you don't understand. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I do understand. Don't. Don't grab that. You don't need that. No, but Lord God, I'm 56 years old. I know what I need. And he's like, no, you don't. You've proven it to yourself time and time again. Let me lead you. 
That's what he's saying. It's a lack of faith that causes me to break down in my obedience to him. All right, listen. Let's go to the next aspect. So remember, we see God as a perfect heavenly father. The second one is this, is that we as his children are not inter, we are not independent, but we are interdependent. We acknowledge our need for us. One of the things that burdens my heart more than anything else is the hundreds of people who come to church on Sunday and they are not connected to the body in any way. That is not God's will. That is not God's will. Somehow that is a distortion that is going to cause people to be taken off guard. They're going to meet Christ thinking that they were fully involved and he's going to go, whoa, 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 I, 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 don't, I don't know you. That is a warning, folks. And I'm not saying that that's true of us, but man, it is easy for us to get into that mindset where I come five minutes before, I leave five minutes after, I church around, I go here to this church and that to that church, and then I serve here or serve there, but I don't belong to any church. No, no, no. We are called to belong to a body of believers. I need you, and I recognize you need me. If you don't believe that, that's between you and the Lord, and I can't convince you of anything. All I know is this. You are standing on unstable ground. I don't care how much you profess your faith. That's the facts. That's the facts. And that's Scripture speaking, not Tom Fitzmaurice. Listen to what Hebrews says. Hebrews 10, verse 25. Let us not give up on meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another as we all the more as we see the day approaching. Let me give you the context in which this is given. These are believers who have believed in Jesus Christ from the very beginning. These were people who lived in the outskirts of Jerusalem. They've been following the Lord for now 24 years. And every preacher, every elder is like, hey, Jesus is going to break through the clouds any minute. And you know what they found out? Year after year, Jesus didn't break through the crowd. And they're like, man, I lost family. I lost businesses. I don't even live in my hometown anymore. I was kicked out. They were going to kill me, burn down my house. He goes, I live in a foreign land. And you know what they started to think? Well, maybe I need to start pulling back a little bit and grabbing a little bit for myself because I think I'm going to be on this earth for a long time. And he's like, don't do that. Don't do that. He's like, fully invest, fully give in. Don't back up. Don't waver. Don't run away. Trust in the Lord. Trust that everything that he's doing is for a purpose, and it is meant for your good and his glory. But they were pulling back. They were pulling back. I wonder how many churches, and I'm not saying this as a, as a condemnation in any way, but I wonder how many saints are not at church because today is Super Bowl Sunday. I wonder how many people would not be in church if the bears, what, it would take a miracle, be, be in, so we don't have to worry about that one. Uh, but if they were in the Super Bowl, you know? All right, listen to this. The orphan heart is fiercely independent and it is self-reliant. Why? And this is the sad truth. Because experience has taught them that people cannot be counted on. Isn't that kind of what the broken world around us teaches us? A little bit? Yeah, the orphan heart sees that many times people are obstacles. The person who thinks like this is in danger of seeing people as objects to be used to meet their personal goals or needs, or they see people as people to be avoided, things to be avoided. I don't want you into my life. I'd like to keep you at a very superficial and business level. Hi, how are you? My name is Tom Fitzmaurice. I'm your brother in Christ, and that's as close as you'll get to me. Listen, we were in a broken state. We lived in a broken world. And God's like, no, 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 now you're mine. I'm going to heal all these things. I want to tell you a quick story. And this is not a, a, a new life story, but I heard of someone who was leading worship at a very, very successful church for five years, five years. And they were doing an excellent job. The church growed 1,500 people. And they just got tired. They were done. They were like, man, I just kind of want to go to something else, some other ministry. I want to take it easy for a little while. And that's okay. They went, went through the process, and they got another person to take that lead. And then they left the church. And when I heard this, I was like, wait, wait, what? They, they did what? They left the church. And you know what I wanted to say to this person? Who, who were you serving for the last five years? If I become a pastor who they tell me to sit down because someone's now being called to do it, you'll never get rid of me. I'll be at the door. I'll mop the floors. I will seat people. I don't care. You're my family. 
You know what? I can leave anywhere to do any ministry in any church, but I can't find you anywhere else. I go home at the end of the day because that's where my family is at. I come here and I serve here because you matter to me most. There are so many people that are given over and they are uh, fully uh, faithful to their calling and their gifting. Can I tell you something? You know what my calling is? People. It's you. The only reason I have a gifting is for him to use me to minister to you his love for you. You understand what I'm saying? This is what it is to be... This guy was pushing me. <laughs> so I want to just say this. This is what we are. We, we no longer live with this fierce independence and self-reliance. We no longer believe that people cannot be counted on or they're obstacles to meeting our need. The child of God belongs to a family and they receive a gift to serve the family. The gift doesn't matter. It's not your gift or my gift to begin with. It's his gift for him to receive the glory. The orphan spirit probably, through experience, has learned vendor-style relationships. You've probably heard me speak of this. They grew up in an environment where love was given only in order to receive. And if the love wasn't given the way that that person wanted it, they would withdraw right? In vendor-style relationships, if they believe that anything prevents them from getting what they want, they can get away, pull back, or if they believe that they could get something more or better somewhere else, they will leave without remorse. That's what the orphan heart does. And there's many within the church that do it. Man, that is not what we are called to do. That is not what we are called to do. For the orphan, relationships are expendable. Uh, for the orphan, relationships are expendable, but with Christ, relationships are everything. Relationships are everything. Here, listen to this. Here's the next point. The child of God says, I am not a free agent. Sometimes I have learned that the free agent is the most talented, gifted person within a group or community, but their motivation and their drive for success and satisfaction is purely aimed at oneself. That's why when you come here and say, hey, I've got this gift and I want to be used, you know what we say? Sit down, belong to a group, be into a community, be in a life group, show how much you love, fall in love with the people, and then God will put you where he wants you to be. Don't tell me how gifted you are. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. No offense. I don't want to sound mean. I, listen, that is not the way. That, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I can say difficult things without being difficult myself. I got to learn that. Please pray for me. But I'm just saying, we don't call you because you have a gift. Oh, man, I really want that person to part of the church because they got a great gift. Boy, we could put them up front. Boy, they're great speakers. Boy, they're great teachers. Boy, they're great musicians. Listen, if you're not doing it out of love, do you know what Paul says? You can have whatever gift you think you want. If you could speak whatever tongue there is upon the earth, you're just a noisemaker without love. Man, I'm just telling you. There is a different purpose. There's a different impetus. There's a different reason for us doing whatever God has called us to do. The child of God says, I am not a free agent. Oh, listen to this. Free agency. I'm going to give you a sports metaphor. I know you guys hate this. But sports, uh, I, I was always a fan of sports, man. I loved it. I, I was a Cubs fan before I woke up and knew that it was the wrong thing to do. <laughs> Sorry, Gil. That's all right, bro. We can, we'll wait for you to repent. Um, but I, I used to go to the teams in the 1970s, man. The Cubs were the worst. They were the pits. And I used to go in there, and after the seventh inning, you'd get in for nothing. And we would wait, and we would have these guys. And there were some terrible, awful players who will never, ever get into the Hall of Fame. But they would spend hours outside in the parking lot signing our autographs, taking pictures with people. They would talk to people. And you know what? That's what happens when there's love. You know, before there was free agency, which I believe ruined sports and caused me to be like, man, these guys are all for themselves. I used to fall in love with players because I felt that they loved me. Does that make sense? That's the mentality of the church. That's the mentality. You want to write something down? God wants his children to be true servant leaders. And that always comes from loving commitment to one another. 
Man, we are in the day and age where we see worship teams that are not connected to churches. What? Maverick? How about apostasy? Man, we are called to be committed to a body of believers, and your gift doesn't matter if it's not aimed at the right person with the right motive. A family connection and loyalty to one another with sincere love is very powerful. It has the ability to transform my life by spilling over the borders of who I am and affects the other compartments of my life. I like this as an example. God gives us this incredible life-giving love. We're no longer divorced from him. So he pours out his goodness and his, his grace and his love into us, and it pours out over the borders of my life. And what happens is, is it me makes a puddle. So it starts to affect the people around me. The first person that's closest to me is my wife. She should feel it most. Then my children. And then the people I work with and the people that I'm committed to. Do you understand? That's how God works. And before you know it, you're in this flood of God's grace that poured over you to make the flood. Does that make sense to everybody? That's what God does for the children of God. It is a transformative power that is able to change me from being fearfully insulated and people who hedge full investment. Why? Why are there so many who fear full investment? Because they feel they're going to waste the precious days of their life. I heard it from someone at work. They're like, dude, you've done enough. It's time for you to live. And you know what? I listened to him for about 30 minutes. I was like, yeah, you know, you're right. <laughs> and then by God's grace, he snatched me. He goes, this person's a crazy person. Don't listen to them. And I realized, yeah, they're a crazy person. I love you, but get out of my truck. But that's the way it works. It teaches me, uh, it, it pulls me out from fearful insulation. And what does it do? It makes me comply with God's will to be committed and fruitful. God literally, here's something to write down, and I'm going to give you a scripture. God literally sanctifies you and me by replacing a distorted commitment to self as our first priority. You want truth of that? Because it's a definitive statement. Remember I said, I can't give you one without proof of scripture. Go to Philippians chapter 2. If you got your Bibles, and if you don't have it, remember to bring it next week. Chapter 2, verse 1. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if there's any comfort from his love, do you have any comfort from Jesus' love? Can you enumerate it? Because I can. I can list it. Why? Man, I'm the least intelligent person in this room. I could almost guarantee it. And you know what, man? I can enumerate the ways that he loves me, man. He says this, if there's any fellowship with the Spirit, is there fellowship with the Spirit? Yes, I have struggled with loneliness my whole life. It used to put me into dark dungeons where I would do damaging, destructive things and care not. I didn't care. If you told me you meant me on one of my benders, you're going to hell, and I go, yeah, that's where I probably deserve to go. And I wasn't lying. But now I feel I'm something, I'm a part of something bigger. Even when I feel like going into that hole, Man, it pulls me out and says, no, this is not where God wants me to be. He does not want me to be in a prison. Does anyone know what I'm talking about here? He says this, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Remember that. That's what Christ is saying is our call and sonship. Now, I want you to be clear. That doesn't mean that you're not supposed to take care of yourself. That doesn't mean he's telling you to quit your job. He's not telling you to, to not bathe anymore and just take care of the church. Please keep bathing. God wants you to take care of yourself. God wants you to sleep well. God wants you to invest well. He wants you to live a wise life. God wants you to get exercise because your body matters. Can I tell you that? It matters. God wants you to get mental rest. You know what me and my wife did yesterday for the first time in a long time? And we had a Saturday where the kids went out all day long. It was just us. Man, we ate breakfast together, had coffee together, and then watched 
uh, NCIS like old people all day long. <laughs> and you know what? I enjoyed my Sunday so much more because of that day of rest. Take your days of rest. Take your days of rest. But what it does mean is that we have to connect our pleasure and our success to a supportive and regularly committed relationship. That means what life group are you connected to? Oh, I'm not connected to, Pastor. I'm busy with something that ain't going to matter. Choose. Choose this day which way you'll go. Uh, it's not up to me. I remember I was listening to Pastor Mark uh, one time, and you think Pastor Mark has it always under, you know what I mean? That guy's like spit polished, right? And I'm like, man, I listen to him. I'm like, man, I got to really follow that guy's lead. And he was talking about how difficult it is to minister to the church. You know why it's difficult? Because people are people and they fail. And people are hard, are hard to love over the long period of time. And you know what he says? Every day I ask the Lord this one thing. Baptize me afresh in your love for your people. That's something that we should pray over and over and over. Help me to love people with your love. God bless you. Listen to this. I want you to hear this as we finish up. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And I'm sorry if this is a difficult message, but it's something that we have to be confronted with. Because if you're like me, I am constantly tempted to say, that's enough. I've done enough. And I'm not saying, listen, you could be compulsive in your service to the church. And that's not what God wants either. Because we could quickly get distorted. But I do want to say this. My my reason for living is not primarily for me to get out of life what I think I want. God says, I know what you need, and what I have for you is better than what you could earn or produce in yourself. That's what he's asking you, to trust him. Trust him with your today. Listen to what it says here. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, in full view of God's mercy, let us offer our bodies, therefore, as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is, listen to this, our reasonable act of worship. If I feel no impetus toward love for you, that is not reasonable. It means I am not looking at the cross of Christ. I am not aware of his sacrifice of love for me. It says this, let us therefore conform no longer to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Remember, the culture we live in is trying to mold you into its image. It's why we have to be constantly encouraged, constantly prompted, constantly challenged. American culture sadly has affected us very greatly, and I'm not saying that we are supposed to drop everything as our responsibility, but what I am saying is this. If you're a child of God, the mark of a child makes space and room for God to use us in his process of making fully devoted, fruitful followers of Christ. And how do we do that? By loving well. This is what God has called us to. Amen? Amen. All right, listen. That's enough of, of this message today, and we're going to go back to that. But what we want to do is we want to bring the people up for, for, for baptism, and we want them to give us testimony. All right, Stephanie, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'll hold this for you. you. Let's everybody give her a round of applause. She's very timid. This is a very scary thing. Hi, everyone. Um, so my life before I met Jesus was very cloudy and stormy, to say the least. There was definitely a void in my heart that I spent a good 11 years seeking to fill. To recap, I was born and raised Catholic. I was baptized as a baby in Guatemala, and my ma did a great job bringing us to church. As I completed my first communion and confirmation, I felt like I didn't get God's message, but I did have a seed planted. As a young student in school, I was polite and quiet. No one knew the struggles I faced at home with an alcoholic dad, and he eventually abandoned his wife and three girls. 
I finished high school and the world began. I tried to fill that void with parties. God said no. I tried to fill that void with party friends. God said no. I tried to fill that bo- void with boys. God said no. And I tried to fill that void with pot. And God said no. I came to know Jesus by God's grace. I just got out of a relationship with an atheist. And I was bummed, but I was very happy it did not work out. Eventually, I met a guy whose smile and talk about Jesus really warmed my heart. He took me on a trip to Kentucky, and we went to see Noah's Ark. And I had an overwhelming experience, ziplining and walking through the Ark. Everyone was so nice, and God was definitely dwelling in that place. At the end of the walkthrough, there was a giant door. And as I remember back to it, all I remember is, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Jesus is our door to salvation. Matthew 7, 7. I knew God was smiling because I was back home. I continue to show, to know more about Jesus through new life, through my sisters, through women's Bible study, and my brothers and my family. I am baptized, I'm being baptized today because I believe with all my heart that God sent his one and only son to live and die on the cross for me and you. That's correct. <laughs> Faith without action is dead, James 2.17. I'm willingly picking up my cross and spreading the good news for my King Jesus Christ. <laughs> This is, a, this is a good guy right here. All right, all right, read it. Right. Um, I grew up in a Christian household, so from early I was exposed to God and his word. Although, although I knew of God, I didn't read the Bible or go to church consistently. Throughout my teenage years, all I cared about was filling the hole in my heart with sports, average grades, and so on. Uh, and before I met Christ, this life was filled with a lot of solitude and darkness. And one way I learned to cope with it was to become numb to everything. And the world reinforced that way of living too, um, and it has a funny way of telling you that you don't have that you don't have something, and that you have to chase that something to be happy. And the world constantly reminds us that we're missing it. And um, this led me to putting my head down and ignoring everything else, and just to chase. And I was 21, and everything was looking good for me. And uh, I had a good paying job, a girlfriend, about to graduate with a good GPA, a car, savings, etc. You know, I just had passed a written exam for the police academy. I was finding security and satisfaction in all these things, and I was so confident in my own strength that I didn't really see a point in seeking God. I believed in him, but I didn't do anything that would help me to get closer to him. And for example, my, cre- my sister, Cresia, gave me a Bible for Christmas one year, and I ended up regifting it because I couldn't see no use for it. Uh, because I had built my life upon these things of, of, of this world, I wasn't prepared for when, the, when those foundations started crumbling. And it wasn't a question of if they started crumbling, it was a question of when. And because when you were, you're building your life upon these things apart from God, they would be shaken and unstable. You know, the first thing to go was, you know, my girlfriend, and then I ended up quitting my job. And I'm saying all these things not for pity, but just to see how much walls that he had to break down to finally mold me in his image. Uh, so I ended up quitting my job, you know, and I graduated just to find out that, you know, I couldn't continue the police ap- academy. And uh, my degree was useless, and I got in a small car crash with some debt. You know, I got caught for speeding, almost went to jail. All of this occurring in a span of two to three months, and I couldn't even catch my breath. And on top of that, on top of not being able to find a job with my degree, I started just wandering the world aimlessly. And I turned to alcohol to help numb the, that pain and that sense of regret. And I was so angry at who I was, and I blamed the world because that was the only way I could play the victim. And I could have, you know, I could have a reason to be a screw up. But, and there I was at rock bottom, you know, in that darkness, Jesus shined his light. And that is where I heard God call my name. I was lost, yet he knew exactly where I was. And throughout those months, I had been taking my sister, Cresia, uh, and my nephews to church without ever actually going inside. And there came a Sunday in March last year when something inside me just told me to stay. And that's when I met Pastor Tom, uh, who, was not being afraid, who was not afraid to be vulnerable with me. Hearing him share what God had done in his life just left me in awe. And after a few Sundays, I got a text from this unknown number claiming to be Matt Huerta, inviting me to young adults. And, we found out he was a liar. Right? I, 
I, I did what any reasonable adult would do, and I blocked the number. Uh, I'm, You'll find stalkers. <laughs> uh, I'm kidding. I just I took him up on the invitation, and after spending so many years alone, not depending on anyone outside my family, God gave me something I had lost all hope in, and that was friends. Um, I do have to recognize someone specifically, though, that I believe God used to call me to him, and that's my sister, Cresia. Uh This woman constantly... Uh, this woman constantly t uh, told me to come to church, and she prayed for my salvation. And when she needed to step up for our family, she did. She sacrificed for my other sister, Carla, and I. She would take me to McDonald's because I was a picky brat. <laughs> Most of all, though, she didn't give up on me coming to Christ. Uh, so, Cresia, thank you. Um, God, thank you for blessing me with a loving and caring sister and family. Thank you for using her and all these people in the room to show me the love you have for me. Uh, I now understand that God took away these idols and securities I had in my life because he had something so much better around the corner, and that's being molded in his image. And after searching for peace in this world, uh, nothing can come close to the peace I ha now have in God. I... I have my Father in heaven in my corner guiding me throughout life. And when, time ta when tough times come, I will remember Psalm 11, uh, 3 to 4. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. I am getting baptized today because I no longer live for myself. Jesus Christ sacrificed his life for my sins, for my salvation. Therefore, I utterly submit to uh, Christ and his will. And I profess to Jesus Christ, and I accept him as my Lord and Savior. Romans 5, 1 through 11. Sorry, that's kind of long. Okay. Uh, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that, our, that sufferings produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now re received reconciliation. That's powerful. Good job. Good job. All right, let's all stand up and worship. Let's celebrate this time.
All right, my question is to you, have you been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Where do you belong? Where, where, where do you belong? You're not supposed to attend. You're supposed to participate. Man, we want to help you. We want to help you. If you want to be baptized today, don't leave before you come see me. We'll get you somebody. We'll work you through the blue book. Listen, man, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God will walk you step by step. Once he commits to you, he will never turn away from you. He will never forsake you. And he will never fail in your life. So let's pray. But we, before we do that, we hold hands here. So let's hold hands. Let's pray with the unity, the unity, the only unity that Jesus can purchase for us. We're no longer, we're no longer connected to ourselves and devoted to ourselves. We are now connected to the fullness of God's will and his plan in this world. So let's pray with one voice. Father God, we love you. We love you for everything that you do. We love you for your generosity. We love you for your perseverance. We love you for your kindness. Lord God, this song, it just reminds me how you chase us down. We're, we're drowning in, in grace sea. When we're weary, you lift our head to see your glory. Without your mercy, without your kindness, without your, your favor toward us, we would all die in the wilderness. But Lord God, you have called us, you have chosen us so that you can pour your abundant life in us. You want to share your mission with us, Lord God, so that when it's all done, when everything is culminated and you come back to claim that which is your own fully and completely, putting down all your enemies, we will have a united joy because you have shared your mission with your family, a kingdom of priests. Father God, I pray that you would use us for your glory. Transform us and change us. Give us the courage to surrender our lives to you minute by minute and step by step. And we all pray this in Jesus' name. And the saints said, you guys have a great day.